Hello everyone, my name is Guillermo Gallego and today we are talking about uh, optical flow, in particular event-based optical flow. So what is optical flow? Optical flow is a technical topic uh, with more than 40 years of research. So it's kind of difficult to compress uh, all that we know about the topic in, in a few minutes and I will not pretend to do it. Instead I will just first give a brief overview of what it is and then try to address it from the point of view of event-based cameras. Okay, so event uh, optical flow is the apparent motion of pixels on the image plane. What does it mean? It means that when we move uh, things in our retina, the, the patterns of brightness in our retina move and that's all that we perceive and the motion of those uh, uh, brightness patterns, that's what we called uh, optical flow. So the goal of, for example, optical flow estimation is to find out if we have a, like a technology, like a, like a camera, we want to find out what this optical flow is, but uh, without knowledge about the world uh, in terms of camera, your motion or uh, depth. It means that we are going to try to estimate the apparent motion of the velocities on the image plane without solving the slam problem, without the simultaneous localization and mapping. Because if we knew everything in the world, if we knew where the objects are, how far they are from us, and, um, and how are we moving, how is our retina uh, moving, then we would be able simply by uh, projecting things in the world into the retina, we would be able to know the true motion. We would not need to estimate it. Yeah, so it's it's kind of, uh, that's what optical flow is typically understood for, is that you are going to analyze the, the brightness patterns that happen in, in the retina, in the case of, of a camera on the image plane, and extract uh, motion information, so 2D velocities. So why is it called optical flow? Well, because it's a flow field, and so if you remember what a flow field is, um, so we have scalar fields that are just uh, one number at every point, and a flow field is kind of like a small, uh, there is a small vector, well, there is a vector at every point. That's kind of represented on, on the right uh, of this image. So, so let us go through what these images are. So optical flow is a very important quantity for for animals, in particular for insects, to to move around and uh, to perceive the motion in the, the world, right? So imagine that you have in, in this case like a, it could be a bee, and uh, and the bee it's, it's rotating uh, to the left. That's what this arrow is indicating. But from the point of view of the bee, what it looks like is if it was static, it would be that the rest of the world is rotating uh, in the opposite direction. So it's rotating clockwise to the right. And that's kind of what we see on, on this plot. That is the, uh, represented what the, the motion of, of the world would look like from the point of view of the bee. And if we, instead of representing it in 3D, we represented it as a projection in 2D. Well, that's what, uh, what the image on the right uh, represents instead of being like um, these vectors on the surface of the sphere if we projected these vectors on the on the image plane with some panoramic uh, transformation this is the flow field that uh, represents the motion in the scene now the bee would see this that is the true motion and it will try to estimate it right it will try to estimate this this motion from the patterns of brightness that it sees on the patterns of light that it comes to the to the, to the eye. And that's what we will do. So it's it's important to distinguish, and we will soon see the difference between optical flow and what what is called motion field. Important thing to remember is that optical flow it's uh, it's um, it's a flow field. So in every point on the image plane, what we are looking for is for a for a vector. And we will see that it's better, easier, more reliably reliable to estimate in some points than in others. Okay, so let's take example of an event camera that it's looking at a single edge here represented on the on the left. It's a black to white transition, uh, the simplest possible edge, and the edge is moving to the right, and the camera is static. 
So if you take a pixel somewhere here on the, on the right part, then we'll see that it will become black. So the pixels that are white become black. That means that there is a brightness decrease. And that's what we plot in the middle. We plot uh, the off events. So the negative events are black over a gray uh, background. And on the right, uh, what it's plotted is the, a map of uh, the last timestamp, so what it's usually called the time surface. So let me let me play this, and what you see is the edge moving at some speed from left to right. We are just plotting the last 1,000 events, right? So it's moving, and as it, as it moves, it's creating this uh, time map. You see how the how events that are more recent are brighter and the events that are more in the past are darker. So if we wanted to ask the question, what is optical flow? Uh, well, in the case of an event-based cameras, we are observing this edge and this edge uh, creates these patterns of events as it moves. And we are interested in knowing the, the speed, basically the velocity at which the edge is moving. We see that it's moving to the right, and now we would like to estimate its speed. So if we look at the same uh, edge, but now from the point of view of the events, and this is a rep representation that we, we are familiar with. So we are plotting here the x and y axis, and in, in vertical we are representing time. And we see that at some, uh, at some time, 2.8, the edge is more or less here, but then it's it's moving, time is increasing, and the edge is moving uh, to the right, so towards increasing axis. And as the edge moves, it's generating this pattern of events. So the question is, at what speed is the edge moving? And well, then the answer is, I guess, quite simple in this case, because we see that we could measure the speed by interpreting the increment uh, in space and the increment in time that the edge has moved. So we could approximate this kind of point cloud of events uh, with, uh, with a plane. So we could fit a plane to this point cloud or point set and then measure uh, how much it moved uh, horizontally uh, in some given time and divide both and that's the, the speed and the velocity it's the this number and the direction is is to, towards the right so in the in the case that we had before with some numerical example imagine that now we are looking at this point where the there is the edge that has has moved uh, so it's at uh, at a pixel with uh, row uh, number 81 so the y coordinate is 81 and it's at time 2.89, it's at x location 133 pixels. Then we go a bit into the past and we see that uh, the edge, uh, when it was some time in the past, maybe it was here and we could see, uh, because it was moving to the right, at the same uh, row location, 81, then at time 2.547, it was at pixel location 101. So now we have everything that we need. We know the two times and the two pixel coordinates, and we could divide the increment in X by the increment in time, and we will see that the edge was moving at a velocity of approximately 93.3 pixels per second. So that's for this, this little example on event-based cameras to basically to emphasize that the optical flow, what we are really measuring or what we would like to find out um, is uh, the velocity of the of the edge patterns moving on the retina or on the image plane it's important to understand that optical flow is not the same as motion field and some people confuse them or use one uh, in, yeah instead of the other so Motion field is often confused and it's called optical flow. So a motion field is the physical motion, so the 3D motion of objects that it's projected 
onto the image plane. So imagine that you have some points and each point has some velocity, some 3D velocity, and then if you have a perspective camera model, you could project these points and these velocities and their projections on the 2D image plane. So in, in our case, it would be on the retina, that would be the motion field. So it's, that's basically it. It's the it's 3D motion projected onto the image plane. And to see or to appreciate what's the difference between motion field and optical flow, well, we could ask ourselves, what are the cases in which uh, they differ? Is there optical flow is not the same as motion field? And we have seen already or discussed one in the, in the course, and that's the barber pole illusion. So um, imagine you have um, a cylinder that it's rotating and it has these uh, band patterns. So when it rotates, um, regardless of what is the, the pattern of the band, we know that the points, they have a motion in 3D and we projected that motion and those points on the image plane where we, we should see or the, the true motion, uh, it's, it's so the projection of the 3D motion onto the image plane, it's the motion field, we would see that um, it's uh, horizontal instead because uh, the, the object has this band texture, what it looks to us is that the motion uh, is it's going not to the right, but upward, maybe a bit to the left. So it's, we can only determine the, the motion that it's perpendicular to, to the edge. And in this case, the edge is, uh, yeah, it's a bit skewed. So basically that's one example where the motion field and the optical flow are not the same. So you have to be careful between both. So can we further look at more examples? So where is optical flow approximately the motion field equal to the motion field where there are three types of neighborhoods uh, that we could consider on, on image points. So forget about now that we are talking about uh, event cameras. Let's consider like a normal camera and consider this image and there are three uh, regions or three small neighborhood and consider that the image is moving for example to the right well if you have a region of constant brightness such as the the sky here um, which is amplified or zoom in on, on the right then just by looking at this region it's basically impossible to determine the motion we, don't, we cannot know if it's moving to the left, right, up or down, uh, because all surrounding areas around it, uh, they are also very similar. Um, so what do algorithms do in, in such a case when they are analyzing images and they provide uh, optical flow for the entire images? Well, they either uh, say that uh, they are not uh, good at, at estimating optical flow in these regions, or they fill in using some priors or some regularizers. Another type of region is uh, basically when you have like here, it's almost like a 1D, like a single edge. And in this case, uh, if the motion is to the right, you, we would see the edge that is moving uh, to the right, but it would also be the case if the edge was moving um, a bit up and to the right. So we, we would not be able to distinguish uh, both motions. Basically, um, it's also the same in, in this case, consider that we have the edge and, and it's moving um, instead of to the right, consider that we, that we move along the edge. So basically, it would not be possible for us to determine that we are moving. It would be as if the edge is static because there is not enough information. The only thing that it's possible to do in this situation is to only determine um, the component of the flow, the component of the motion that is perpendicular to the edge. And that's called the normal flow. And finally, there is a third type of neighborhood uh, that is kind of a corner or a complex edge pattern. Um, so there are brightness gradients in more than two directions, sorry, more than one direction. And this is unambiguous. In this case, it's unambiguous to determine the motion. Basically, we move this corner that it's this edge pattern that is moving a little bit to the left, to the right. It's it's possible to determine uh, the direction in which uh, in which it it moved. 
So these are all three cases uh, where the motion field, for example, it's towards the right, but uh, only in one of the uh, three cases, uh, optical flow is a good approximation of the motion field. And that's basically the last one, the, the case where there is a corner or a complex edge pattern that is unambiguous. Okay, and here, just for the sake of simplicity, we omitted noise occlusions in, in this analysis. So we said that the motion field is the projection of uh, the 3D motion onto the image plane, and it has two components, one that it's rotational and does not depend on the depth, and one that it's translational and depends on the depth of the scene. So it causes parallax, or it represents parallax. Basically, this is the equation that relates uh, the velocity on the image plane, so uh, the flow at a single pixel, and the pixel has coordinates x, y, with the relative motion between the, the camera and the scene, which has uh, 3D velocity and has two components, the linear velocity and an angular velocity, um, represented as v and omega. And, um, Basically, the part that is multiplying the angular velocity, you see that there is a two by three matrix and only depends on the x, y coordinates. It doesn't depend on the depth. That's kind of the rotational component. And then there is the translational component of the motion field that depends on both x, y, the linear velocity, but it's also uh, multiplied by the inverse depth. So basically, that's something that we observe that when we have objects that are uh, moving in front of us, uh, the closer they are, the bigger the apparent motion that they cause on a retinas, and the farther uh, they are from us, the the smaller the apparent motion. That's this dependency that is captured by by the depth. So this is the equation uh, that relates the three um, D velocities and the pixel coordinates and the depth to the optical flow, and that's basically sorry the motion field. That's basically telling you how you can compute the projection of the of the true motion on the image plane. This is the equation. And the goal is uh, to try to estimate this uh, to the velocity from edge patterns. Because if we knew uh, the, the relative motion between uh, the, the scene and the, and the camera, so imagine that you are in the case of a robot that it's moving around and it has created a map of the scene uh, and it's constantly estimating its motion. So it's, for example, solving the simultaneous localization and mapping problem. Well, in that case, uh, it knows the camera pose, so it can estimate as well the, the velocity. Um, and it has a, a map of the world, so it, it can compute from the current point of view of the camera what's the distance or the, the depth with respect to every point in the, in the world. So you have everything that you need. All the right-hand side is known in the case of SLAM, and then you can compute um, the 2D velocity on the image plane. And this is basically what it's done uh, sometimes to acquire ground truth uh, data to provide to estimate or to compare the optical flow. You first solve the SLAM problem, which mostly works on static scenes. And then with that information, you project it onto the image plane and you compare it with the optical flow that you have computed and then there is the error and you try to optimize for it. Uh, interesting topic in frame-based vision and sometimes it, it also appears in some algorithms in, uh, in event-based vision is the topic of brightness constancy and this is something that we have already seen in some previous video uh, in the context of the linearized event generation model. Um, so where we were explaining how events are caused by moving edges and we, we, we extracted the relationship between the events and the, the spatial gradients and, and the velocity in which, at which the edge is moving. So let's review what brightness constancy is in, in the general case, it doesn't need to be with, with event cameras. Brightness constancy is basically an assumption uh, that says that when, when an object is moving, um, the intensity uh, of the point when, when it's moving along the image plane, it's, it's constant. That's kind of only um, true in, uh, 
in some in some cases, but for short time it's it can be a sum. So what is represented with this equation is that if L is the brightness signal and it has three components, x, y, and time, the brightness signal that arrives at the photo receptor, so at the image plane, basically saying that for all points x, t that are corresponding to the same object point, uh, so the projection of a 3D point could be, or if the 3D object is moving, well, all the points x that correspond to the same 3D point as the object moves. Uh, this brightness or this intensity on the image plane is constant. That's the assumption and yeah, it might not be true depending on, on reflection on things, but for for short uh, uh, for short periods of time, we could assume that it's uh, approximately true. And therefore, we, we look at it from a differential point of view. And if we take the derivative on both sides, well, the derivative of a constant is zero. That's kind of here. And the derivative of the brightness uh, at the, on this trajectory, and we we take the the total derivative, and then we compute the chain rule. Basically, we have the derivative of the brightness with respect to space. That's the gradient of L. And then dx dt. This is the, represented in Newton notation with x dot, and it's the velocity of the point along the trajectory, which is also sometimes we wrote it as v. We call it, and that's the optical flow. And uh, and then the the partial derivative of the brightness with respect to time. So the right hand side is nothing more than the the chain rule on um, taking the derivative of brightness with, with respect to time. And we see that now uh, the optical flow explicitly appeared in this equation. Now let's count how many equations and uh, unknowns we have. Because if L is known, we can compute the spatial gradient and we can also compute the temporal derivative, uh, partial derivative with respect to time. So this is a vector, this is a scalar, and this is a scalar equation. And we have, in principle, if we don't know the optical flow, there are two unknowns, the velocity in the x direction and the velocity in the y direction. So we have one equation and two unknowns, which means that it's undetermined. There are infinite solutions that could solve this, right? Um, so a typical question is how, how do we go about it? In frame-based cameras or in event-based cameras? This was an early question in, in research. Um, basically, we need to add more constraints because we need to, uh, if we want to determine the, those unknowns, we need more equations. Now, there is the additional problem that event cameras do not provide the brightness. So how do we get around this? How would we be able to um, use this equation in the case of event cameras? Because we know that more or less event cameras gives us they give us uh, the temporal derivative of brightness. But we are still missing the, the spatial one. And this is something that has been uh, trying to be addressed in, in research papers. Okay, so this concludes a very short introduction about optical flow. And I encourage you to take a look at um, classical books in computer vision uh, to, to know in much more detail what optical flow is. And here are just a few links. Um, this is uh, a nice paper that is comparing many different methods on, on frame-based vision, how to compute optical flow. Uh, Scholarpedia has a very uh, deep discussion or a presentation of the different methods, the different assumptions that are used to compute optical flow. And there was recently this workshop, and there is a, there is a paper about it that tries to emphasize what's optical flow, what's the importance. So it can be used for navigation, it can be used for gesture recognition, it can be used for so many things. It's a low level uh, in vision, uh, uh, low level processing um, stage that has many, many applications. Thank you very much.